Well, good morning, People's Church. Happy Mother's Day. I want to add mine to everyone else who said it so far, but it is a truly wonderful day that we get to uh, give praise and give attention and chocolates to our mothers, uh, and they certainly deserve it. Uh, if you'd allow me a moment to uh, be a little bit selfish with the platform and point out one mother in particular who is very special to me, my wife Debbie, who became a mother this year for the first time. Uh, our daughter is four months old, so this is her first Mother's Day. And yeah! And uh, I want to say, be watching her become a mother has caused me to fall much deeper in love with her and admiration for her, uh, watching her devotion to Claire, her endurance through trials, her joy uh, in the bundle of joy that we have, uh, and she only keeps growing as a mother, and it has actually enriched our relationship. I obviously loved my wife dearly before she was a mother, but now I have new and amazing reasons to love her even more. And that's really what mothers do, is that they enrich lives. They take something and make it so much better. Uh, mothers and mother figures alike, I believe, are gifted by God to do this, to enrich our lives. There are relationships in this world that will cost you energy, and there are relationships that will give you energy. And I believe that, by and large, uh, mothers and wives, but women really, generally speaking, are gifted to be able to be the, give those types of relationships that enrich and give energy to their families, to their communities, the needy people around them, God's people and the church, all sorts of different relationships and different communities are blessed and enriched and poured, get energy poured into them by mothers and by women. We're gonna see that in the passage today. That's Mother's Day, so I thought an appropriate passage would be one that is written by a mother. And we have such a passage in the Bible. Proverbs chapter 31 is said to have been written by the mother of the king. And so we're going to turn there together. Proverbs 31, uh, starting in verse 10. It's going to be a long passage, but it's a great one. So we're going to read from verse 10 till the end at verse 31. So please follow along with me. Proverbs 31, verse 10. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms for the, to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her lips. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also and praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done. Let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Please pray with me. Lord, we want to ask that this particular Sunday you might stretch your hand of blessing upon the mothers and the women here 
our church and in our lives. We pray, Lord, that they would know their true value in your eyes, their importance to this world. And God, I pray that you would help us through passages like this, that we may see your heart, that as a church we may celebrate the giftedness and the amazing potential and importance that women play. I pray, Lord, you may help us to do this. In Jesus' name, amen. This is an enormous passage, 21 verses. Certainly we cannot cover all of it in detail today, and so we are going to brush the surface, but I do encourage you today to go home and to read this passage. Actually, what I'm going to aim to do today is to give each and every one of you a specific reason to go home and to study this passage for yourself. We will all have different reasons to study this passage, hopefully by the end of this sermon. What we have really given to us is a vision of an empowered woman of outstanding character, one who is fully competent and tireless in her efforts, deeply compassionate and wonderfully gifted. She manages a household amazingly and tirelessly. She is industrious, increasing the wealth of the household of the household through different endeavors. She cares for the needy. She's a teacher full of wisdom. There is this, an amazing amount of tasks and responsibilities and a huge variety of them. The title of the sermon today I call The Hardest Job in the World. And that's I think what a mother has, the hardest job in the world. It must be incredibly difficult, consider the number of tasks which they are responsible to perform and the great variety of things they need to be good at. It's amazing. My mom was a really amazing mom and she was good at this, at, at multitasking, of being responsible for a whole number of things all at once. She was really the glue that held our family together through good times and bad. She was there, she was in the midst of all of us. And she is constantly a part of my life and my siblings' lives. Uh, and she is, <laughs> it's funny because I only really communicate with my brother and my sister now through Skype or, you know, long distance on Facebook or things. And so we'll, we'll Skype together. I'll say, oh, did I tell you? No, this has happened in my life. Like, oh, yeah, mom told me. And they, she always beats us to the punch. She's always telling me what my sister's doing way before my sister tells me or my brother or all this kind of stuff. She really is in the midst of everything and, and takes it as a responsibility and joy to, to just hold us all together. When it comes to industriousness, my mom, her industry was Tupperware. She was a Tupperware saleswoman and she was really good at it. Uh, uh, what it meant was that though this woman meant that the wealth of her house increased, the Tupperware in her house increased. We had a wealth of Tupperware. They have this thing where if you meet certain tail, uh, sales targets, you get free Tupperware. We had so much of this stuff. It was embarrassing how much Tupperware we had. But I would be remiss and scolded if I did not say that also the money that she produced through this went towards us going on holidays, went towards Christmas gifts. It was a glorious and wonderful thing that she did for our, our family. And she is a, she's an awesome mom. Back to the text at hand. What we see here is the monumental ways in which this woman enriches the environment around her. She runs a household so well that it increases in wealth. All that are under her care are well provided for and secure for whatever the future may hold. She reaches out to the needy with the excess that she has. Governments cannot boast this. She is putting kings and queens and presidents to shame right now with how well she is running this household, running the environment around her. The lives of her husband, her children, her servants, the needy, the community generally are all blessed and all enriched by her presence. This is an amazing woman. And it's stated in verse 30 and 31 that this springs out of a godly character. That she is who she is because she brings forth these internal resources of one who fears the Lord. 
That is an Old Testament way of saying one who is wise, one who knows who they are and knows who God is and lives out of that reality. She knows who she is. She knows who God has made her to be. She knows who God is and she lives her life in line with these truths. A commentator on this passage, Derek Kidner, says, what we have here is the picture of godliness that is severely practical, of values that are sound and humane, and of success that has been most diligently earned. I think it's very important to note here that these qualities spring out of a heart that is rightly oriented towards God and connected to Him in the right way. Part of having such a heart is knowing your identity, knowing who God has made you to be, and that means knowing your potential. Here's what I want to do today. The last thing I want to do is leave you with a to-do list. The last thing, this is Mother's Day, the last thing any mother needs is another to-do list, okay? That's not what I want to do. What I want to do instead is to spend our time reflecting upon the value that women have in God's eyes. The incredible value and importance that they have in God's eyes. And I want to do this for two reasons. Firstly, because it is not talked about enough. Our society, our culture needs to change in this regard. We do not value women the way that we ought to, the way that God expects from us. And secondly, for the women in particular in the church, I would love you to leave knowing your worth, knowing your potential, because to know that is essential to walking in step with the will that God has for your life. So I want to go for those two reasons. Firstly, because society needs it, and secondly, because I would love it if all the women of our church would know and deeply hold in their heart the true value and importance that they hold in God's eyes. Let's turn to society first. There is a wide and dark stain across all history and across society today, and that is the abuse that is against women. The statistics vary depending on the region and depending on who you listen to, but all of them are horrifying, showing how many women are currently in abusive relationships or over their lifetime will be abused by somebody. The statistics are horrifying. And it all points to the fact that our culture does not value women the way that they ought to. They are denigrated, they are devalued, and disrespected. And as a church, we ought to be part of the solution. However, many times we add to the problem, either by our passivity or bad advice towards victims of abuse and, and movements of change that try to come about, or by the fact that we teach a wrong view of what submissiveness means, an unbiblical, unwise view of what it means. But as Christians, we need to be the ones bringing about this change in our culture right here in this building and in the world around us because we have every reason to do so. God, our God, is always on the side of the abused, always takes up the case and stands in defense of the mistreated. He always takes up the cause of the oppressed, opposes those who abuse and those who mistreat. And if we want to walk in line with God, then we ought to follow Him in this regard. Stand up for those who are abused. Stand up for those who are mistreated. And we need to see women with the value that God has given them and not listen to a culture which has clearly proven time and time and time again that they do not understand the true value that women have in God's eyes. God desires that women be treated rightly by the other people in their lives. You just look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 to see what God says to husbands who do not treat their wives in a way that they ought to. God says, I will not listen to your prayers. If you're a husband and you are not treating your wife the way that she ought to be treated, God is not listening to you. Can you imagine a more horrifying thing. 
And God is not listening to you. Wayne Grudem says this, so concerned is God that Christian husbands live in an understanding and loving way with their wives that he interrupts his relationship with them when they are not doing so. No Christian husband should presume to think that any spiritual good will be accomplished by his life without an effective ministry of prayer. And no husband may expect that an effective prayer life, uh, expect an an effective prayer life unless he lives with his wife in an understanding way, bestowing honor on her. To take time to develop and maintain a good marriage is God's will. It is serving God. It is a spiritual activity pleasing in his sight. So for all the husbands and future husbands in the room, I want to tell you that we have a spiritual mandate to show our wives the proper honor and respect that they deserve, to know her and to know her needs so that you might support her in the way that she needs you. Willard Hurley, uh, a famous marriage counselor, very successful back in the 70s and and 80s, wrote a book, uh, and a very popular book, and he outlined five needs that are commonly shared by women, generally speaking, that we need to pay attention to and to value. Affection, conversation, financial stability, honesty and openness, and commitment. Affection, conversation, financial stability, honesty and openness, commitment. These are the things that we need to be concerned about when it comes to the relationships that we have with the women close to us. Husbands, future husbands, particularly with your wives. You need to make sure that she is getting from you what she needs. And it is a question of value. Because every time we are called to be attentive to another person's need, we must make a decision internally as to whether we think it's worth our time and our resource. And so if we are not being attentive to the needs of the women in our life, then it is a question of value. Do you value them the way in which you ought to? And I want to caution you that this is a cultural blind spot. What I mean by that is often we are not aware even when we are sinning because we are culturally oblivious to it. Be prepared to be wrong. Be prepared to be mistaken. Be brave enough to ask your wife honestly if she feels supported by you. And if she doesn't, even if you don't understand, even if you don't agree, seek to make the change that she requires of you. Our culture needs to change in this way, to see the value and the worth of women as they should be seen through the eyes of God. And we as Christians need to be the most willing of all to make these changes. I firmly do believe in gender roles, but this is far more, actually it is exclusively related to function, absolutely not at all related to value. There is total equality in men and women, in status, in terms of being image bearers of God, in the importance of their calling and their ministry, and in their ability to reflect Christ to the world. Total equality, and it needs to be understood and treated that way. We as a culture have a dark stain upon us that needs to start being removed. And the church needs to be the ones who are most interested in doing this. We turn from culture generally and I want to speak to women in particular. I want, as much as I can, I want you to be able to see the incredible value that God puts upon you. Proverbs 31 is a picture of what is possible and something that the world desperately and deeply needs. In this case, this particular woman is a wife and a mother. And I found Quebec culture, uh, out of all the cultures I've lived in, most particularly to denigrate the importance of mothers in this world. At somehow to choose to not pursue a career, instead to look after your family and to become a full-time mom is looked down upon, seen as insignificant or unfulfilling. I firmly, absolutely am opposed to such a view with good biblical reason. That is not the case at all. Mothers are to be celebrated. 
Mothers have a crucially important ministry to the world at large and to the church in particular. Wayne Max says this, if you are a married woman, your family is to be your most important ministry in life. The contribution you can make there to the kingdom of God and to society cannot be overestimated. Do not pay attention to anyone who denigrates the importance of the family. Your God says otherwise. Believe him. Of course, a great example of this from scripture is Timothy. A godly man who was chosen by Paul because of his incredible depth of faith and commitment to God. A spiritual man, wonderfully gifted, becomes a spiritual son, a close companion to Paul and is given huge responsibility in the setting up of the early church. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and chapter 3, we see exactly where he gets his spiritual pedigree, so to speak, his spiritual heritage from. It's from his mother and from his grandmother. They both possessed such a glorious faith that it rubbing off on him created this man of God who was so instrumental in the early church. What an incredible testimony of the potential a godly mother can make. And it's all throughout the Bible, all throughout the church history as well. Yet, though this is so important, certainly motherhood is not the only way in which women can express their potential and their worth to the church. They could serve the kingdom in an incredible array of ways and do. Take People's Church as an example. All the different ministries we have here are really strengthened and enriched and upheld by the women of this church. And you guys do an incredibly wonderful job in worship, organizing events, planning and running things, feeding the poor, the prayer ministry, more than I could ever hope to list or think of, the church would be crippled without you. You do an amazing, amazing job. Not all are called to motherhood. Some will be called to a lifelong careers where their gifts will be used by God just as effectively but in a different context. That is glorious, that is wonderful. To serve God does not mean that every single woman or man must walk exactly the same path and go down the same way as each other. To serve God means to do what he is telling you to do. You, in particular, what he's telling you to do. And as I said, Proverbs 31 is a vision of a woman who relates to God rightly. In her context, she shows the tremendous impact that this can have and the tremendous way that it is being enriched. The, the, this is really strange, isn't it? <laughs> Hopefully it'll end soon. Oh, it's going away now. Okay. Let's try and plow through it. <laughs> Proverbs 31 is a vision of a woman who rightly relates to God and shows the tremendous impact that a woman in that situation can have. Now, she is in a particular situation, and every setting is different, but the potential remains. The importance and the value remains. And every single woman must meditate on how this potential and this character is going to be applied to their life, their relationships, their goals, how it's going to enrich the environment around them. But what I hope comes across today that every single woman has a profound value to this world and a giftedness that the world desperately and deeply needs and that God is more than willing to burst forth in your life when you're rightly related to him. We all have a reason to look at Proverbs 31 in detail. As children, we must Make sure that the way in which we are relating to our mothers and our mother figures in our life is right. God deeply cares that we show all of our parents the proper respect that they deserve. The Bible is strong on this. One of the last things Jesus Christ does on the cross is he makes sure that his mother is taken care of after he's gone. The Bible cares deeply that children show right respect to their mothers. And so we need to study this passage to understand exactly what it is that a mother does and why they are to be respected and raised up in our view and in our society. 
as husbands or as men, we ought to study this passage so that we can rightly stand opposed to a culture that devalues and demeans women, so that we can understand them and honor them, support them, and value their incredible worth and potential. As women, I ask that you might study this passage so that you would realize and celebrate and live out your importance, your potential that is found in and through God. Lastly, we all need to study this so that in studying this we can understand the great blessings that God has brought into this world through women and through His Holy Spirit's ministry being mediated through the wonderful women and the wonderful mothers in this world today. Why don't we start doing just that by praying to Him right now and thanking Him for that. God, we want to thank You so much for all the women that you have put into this world and all the giftedness that they have and all the wonderful potential and importance and value that they have and bring into this world, the way in which they enrich the environments around them and make them glorious. Thank you so much, Lord, for all the blessings that have come mediated through women throughout history and through our lives. We pray, Lord, that you may bless every single one of them today. Help us be your hands and feet in this world, standing opposed to a culture which devalues and demeans women and motherhood. And show them the respect that you would desire them to have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Why don't we stand together? For all the women in the church, on your way out, the ushers are going to hand you a little gift. I hope you uh, enjoy it this Sunday. But uh, for now, may God and his great love be with you. May the peace and the grace of Jesus Christ go with you this week. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit keep you comforted and encouraged this week. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. God bless. You are dismissed. Missed. 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 Missed.